And thank you yes, Peter, good. for um, inviting me to be part of, of this Good Governance Academy colloquium. I, I'm very honored to be here. Um, the topic of my presentation, as Carolyn said, is outlook in an integrated report. Now, what I want to do today is to show you um, how important outlook information is in an integrated report. And I also want to, well, let me put it this way. If you're a presenter or an executive, or indeed even a, a member of a board of an organization, uh, you want your organization's value uh, creation story to be very presented in a very effective way. If you're an investor or um, an other stakeholder, you want to understand how that organization creates value in the short, medium, and long term. However, it's not that easy to understand how that outlook information has been put together. And that is because it's distributed throughout the report. So what I want to do is to show you um, how organizations build that outlook information within the report, and also how outlook information completes the value creation story. Now, I've used as the um, basis for my presentation uh, a report, uh, an information paper produced by the Integrated Reporting Committee of South Africa was published in uh, December 2019. And that information paper is available on the internet on, on the website of the Integrated Reporting Committee of South Africa. And if you look at the bottom of that slide, you can see the link to it. It's available free, and I invite you to, to download it. So let me begin with a quote from Professor Mervyn King, which appears in that information paper in the forward. He says, a quality, a quality integrated report provides the stakeholders of an organization with balanced and transparent information, which can assist them in making more informed assessments of the organization's prospects and value creation ability into the future. Well, let's see what the international framework says about outlook information. Well, firstly, outlook information is one of the eight content elements that one would expect to find in an integrated report. In regard, in regard to each one of these um, content elements, the framework asks a question, and it's up to the organization to try and answer that question in the, in the presentation of its integrated report. And the question which is asked in regard to outlook is what challenges and uncertainties is the organization likely to encounter in pursuing its strategy? And what are the potential implications for its business model and future performance? Now the framework goes on to say, an integrated report highlights anticipated changes over time and provides information built on sound and transparent analysis about the organization's expectations of the external environment it is likely to face in the short, medium and long term, and how that will affect the organization and how the organization is currently equipped to respond to the critical challenges and uncertainties. Now, the framework also then gives some supporting disclosures which can en enhance the quality of the outlook information. Things like lead indicators, KPIs, or objectives, relevant information from uh, recognized external sources and sensitivity analyses, forecasts or projections with a summary of the related assumptions and comparisons of actual performance to previously identified targets. Now I'm going to be showing you with some examples taken from some of the leading reports in South Africa, how organizations use these supporting disclosures to enhance the quality of their presentations. 
And the framework also then says that disclosures need to take into account legal and regulatory requirements that might exist in the country, and often these would relate to forward-looking information. So why is outlook information so important in the integrated report? Well, firstly, outlook information completes that value creation story, as I mentioned to you at the beginning of my talk. It contextualizes the organization's positioning in relation to the external environment. It sets the organization's strategic path ahead, and it provides the leadership's view on the material uncertainties and challenges that may affect the achievement of the strategic objectives and the potential implications for the organization. And where an integrated report does not offer meaningful insight into the outlook, it diminishes in credibility. So let's then look at the role of the governing body in the presentation of outlook information. And I'm going to begin with uh, a quote from King Four, which is principle number five, where it says, the governing body should ensure that reports issued by the organization enable stakeholders to make informed assessments of the organization's performance and its short, medium, and long-term prospects. And obviously, outlook look information is critical to that. I want to go back to that forward that I mentioned earlier, where I quoted from Professor Mervyn King, because he goes on to talk about uh, the role of the governing body in connection with outlook information. And he starts off by saying, reporting by organizations, in particular financial reporting, has come under heightened scrutiny in recent years. This partly stems from the spate of corporate failures and scandals caused by events not previously reported on, despite being in existence at the time of reporting. And I'm going to mention this when I show the examples. I'll come back to this point. He says, these failures and scandals have had an adverse impact on the perceived integrity of those charged with governance, the board, and the reports they issue to stakeholders. He then goes on to say, the governing body should ensure that outlook information in the integrated report mindfully reflects its view of the organization's strategic path ahead and potential uncertainties, disruptive factors, challenges, and opportunities. And finally says, this is a key component of a quality integrated report and is a part of the governing body's duty of accountability through balanced and transparent reporting. Now, the international framework suggests that organizations should include in the integrated report a statement of responsibility by those charged with governance. And I think Lee mentioned that earlier on. And what should it provide? Well, firstly, an acknowledgement of the responsibility to ensure the integrity of the integrated report an acknowledgement that they have applied their collective mind to the preparation and presentation of the integrated report and their opinion or conclusion about whether the integrated report is presented in accordance with the international framework. Here are a few examples that are taken from South African companies, um, board responsibility statements, and you can see um, I think many organizations today do present these responsibility statements. Sometimes they're signed by the chairman and chief executive. And in a few cases, we see the entire board signs that acknowledgement um, of responsibility. And this certainly enhances the credibility and reliability of the integrated report um, by this acknowledgement by the board. And it also enhances the, the credibility of the outlook information that is presented. Now, in compiling this uh, information paper, the Integrated Reporting Committee of South Africa observed certain weaknesses in integrated reports, and specifically around the outlook information. 
They say the organizations disclose information not material to the organization's value creation process, and it is often vague and generic in nature. And Lee also referred to this. Quite often organizations, when they're looking at information about the external environment, uh, they provide generic information about what's happening um, in the world and not really bringing it down to how it affects value creation in the organization. And then um, there's a, a lack of connectivity between um, the external environment, strategic objectives, risks and opportunities, etc., within the report. They present information in silos without connectors. So it's very difficult for the reader to actually connect the information. And it focuses on short term strategic targets with little disclosure of medium to longer term targets. And often find similar information in reports in the same industries, almost as if they've cut and pasted from one to another. And outlook itself is a very neglected area in many reports and virtually no consideration given to it by the board. Now, the other side of this coin is that, that people preparing integrated reports also have challenges. And the first one which the, the information paper identifies is that outlook information may overstep legal, regulatory, or stock exchange listing requirements. Well, I've yet to see any information that comes close to overstepping those requirements. And I think it is often used as a bit of a smokescreen or an excuse for not uh, uh, disclosing key information. Um, and at the end of the day, it's in the hands of the organization as to what it, it actually presents in its report. And then they say that there's uncertainty as to what the integrated uh, reporting framework requires. Now, I can understand that because the, the actual framework is not very specific as to what the requirements are. So that is one of the reasons why this information paper is so useful, because I think it gives a lot of useful information to organizations and indeed to investors and other stakeholders on how to read the, the outlook information. And then concern about potential risks, including reputational risk and legal liability. Well, I think organizations are more likely to be sued if they don't disclose information than if they do. And in South Africa, we've seen a number of situations in recent years where organizations have failed to disclose some information, but of course it always comes out in the end. And then the impact on reputation is far greater not wanting to create unrealistic expectations about future performance. Well, that's the reason that this information needs to be presented, is to help the, the readers to make more realistic assessments of the future value creation. And then a lack of clear strategy to support long-term planning. I'm going to come back to this point in a moment. And they say that it could influence stakeholders or reduce competitive advantage. Well, you want to influence stakeholders. You want to give them information so that they can make realistic assessments of value creation. And if one looks at competitive advantage, well, again, I, I don't ever see any information that comes close to giving away competitive information. After all, we're not asking the colonel to disclose his recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. So let's have a look at the longer term. And I want to show you why it's so important that organizations look at the longer term. And I want to look at risk probability over time as a basis for it. And I want to look at an example. Now, very often we will look at a risk and say, well, the likelihood of this coming about in a period of one year is very low. But if you look at it over a longer period, over say five or 10 years, what would the impact be on value creation? Your picture changes dramatically. And a very good example is the life-threatening epidemics that we have seen. If one had to look now where we stand and say, what are the chances of a life-threatening epidemic happening over the next 10 years? Well, let's look at that table in the slide. And you can see how many life-threatening epidemics there have been over the last 100 years, starting with Spanish flu, which killed over 14 million people worldwide. 
but look how many there have been since 2010. There have been a number. So if you were in the healthcare industry or a public body, a government or municipality or whatever, this must have been a very high risk coming forward. But I don't want to focus on COVID-19 per se. We could well have in 2021 another virus which is totally unrelated to it. But what I want to highlight is that there are many risks that fit into this kind of category, and many of them flow from those UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, many organizations today in the integrated reports talk about these goals and they talk about what they're doing uh, to, to alleviate them. But in most cases, almost all cases, it revolves around corporate social responsibility. What I try to do is when I talk to organizations to try to point out, if you look at the, the, the long-term value creation of the organization, many of these goals are actually going to impact upon them. And so therefore they need to look at it in terms of their strategy going forward and not only how much they contribute. And they need to look at it in the longer term. Now, if you look at COVID-19, look how it has impacted on the business model of so many organizations. So it's critical that they do look at it over the long term. But even, well, let me put it this way. There are also opportunities that flow from these UN Sustainable Development Goals that we could have seen in the case of COVID-19. There are opportunities for organizations to anticipate changes to their business model and also to implement and take advantage of the changes that are taking place. Now, I said to you earlier on, when I started out, that I will show you how organizations build their outlook picture and also how they use Outlook to complete their value creation picture or story. So let's see how that happens. Outlook is one of the content elements as I showed you, but you know, very often you don't find a separate Outlook section in the report. And why is that? Because it's integrated into all the other sections of the report. And how do they do this? Well, they begin with the external environment looking at those issues, um, might be economic, social, um, technology, all of those issues in the short, medium and long term. So they start to build their outlook picture from the external environment. Flowing from that, they create their strategy, also short, medium and long term. And then flowing from external environment and strategy, there are risks and opportunities and again building that outlook picture to implement their strategy they need various forms of capital and so again short medium and long term they need to build the, the necessary capital to implement their strategy and finally performance what what was their performance like last year what is the current performance and what are the kpis for the future so in this way the organization builds its outlook picture and completes its value creation story. But I'm going to show you how they do that with some examples in a moment. Now the information paper says in determining outlook information, the organization needs to address factors that are material to achieving its strategic objectives in the short, medium and long term. And what is important is that there are some factors that are within the organization's control, controllable factors, such as employee upskilling, or outside of its control, uncontrollable factors, such as in the case of a mine, the dollar price of metal. So it's important when you're presenting information to, to differentiate between controllable and uncontrollable factors. And we'll look at that uh, as well when we look at some examples. Now, I've looked at a bit of the theory behind this, but now let's have a look at some examples. And what I'm also going to do is to look at uh, considerations or advice that, that is included in this information paper. Uh, and then we'll look at the examples around that. And I'm going to look at it through different windows. And the first window I want to look at is expected changes in the external environment, because that's the starting point for for much of the outlook information. 
So what does the, the information paper say about the external environment? How should organizations deal with it? Well, what is the view of the organization on expected changes and how is it equipped to respond? And they say it should explain the potential effects. It should provide a view of how the competitive landscape could evolve in the future and the organization's market position. And then this is especially important where organizations face heightened threats from industry disruptors. And boy, have we seen some industry disruptors in the last two months. But we have a really nice example taken from the banking industry. Ned Bank is a bank that's listed in, on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It has, bank, it has uh, banks around Africa, and um, it's, it, it really has a, 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 a good example here. Banking um, has been through some, not difficult times, but certainly been disrupted by technology. Uh, technology's changed the way that people do banking uh, and it's also taken over jobs. So NetBank in its report, which is really nicely done, they show you, um, they give a description of, of the, the, the issue of digital disruption. They also talk about the impact that it's having because what is happening, it's allowing other organizations to come into the industry. So you're getting new banking entrants. They talk about the their opportunities and, and some of the risks that, that surround that, um, including cyber risk. Now, if you look at how NetBank have presented it, they, they really give a, a, a really good presentation of it and you can see how it's affecting them. But what I found very interesting was that they also talk about the human resource aspects of it because jobs are being taken over by technology. So NetBank says it's training those people that it can to do other tasks and it's not replacing people that leave. Now the interesting thing is that not all of the banks give that conversation in their integrated report. Some of them don't talk about the impact of reducing their branches and their people and as we know some organizations are actually putting people off and it's terribly important to give that balanced report and without that it really undermines the quality of the report. And so you can see how this kind of um, presentation helps to build that outlook picture. Let's move on to uh, strategy, strategic objectives and strategy, continuing to build this outlook picture as we go forward. So we would expect to find the organization would disclose strategic objectives for the short, medium and long term, and then targets and KPIs and how they are going to achieve those objectives. It's done really nicely in a, a report by Redefine, which is a property company that's listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It uh, operates in South Africa and has many operations in countries in Europe as well. Across the top of the slide are the strategic objectives, those five strategic objectives. And you see the same objective down the side of that table and then how will they get there? Uh, what is their strategy in relation to each of those objectives and anticipated outcomes and KPIs? Now, this is their short and medium term priorities. You turn over the page and there you have long term strategic priorities as well as targets and how they wish to measure it. Kumba Iron is another example. Kumba Iron operates in a challenging uh, environment um, and has been challenged for a number of years. Um, and they uh, deal with this by saying, we are focusing our actions on making Kumba Iron more competitive. They then look at how they're enhancing their competitive position. And then they talk about we have structured our strategy around three time-based transformation horizons, and they spell those out, short, medium, and long-term. And then you turn over, and there you have the strategies, your horizon one, two, and three, how they're implementing those strategies, and then what were the key outcomes in 2018. So really a nice presentation 
We know that the organization is challenged, but this is how they're dealing with it, giving you a really good picture uh, to help you formulate a picture for outlook. Let's move on then to risks, likely challenges and uncertainties. So the information paper says, how is the organization responding to these challenges and what mitigating actions is it taking? What are the potential implications for the business model, strategic objectives and financial performance? What strategic allocation plans does it have to ensure access to the capitals it needs, focusing on the availability, quality and affordability? And of course, where we stand at the moment with the, the current state of the world, this is particularly important for organizations to disclose that. And then how is the organization managing its key stakeholder relationships? And what is the quality of those relationships? Anglo-American Platinum is a mining company, obviously operates in rural areas. And one of the key risks that face that organization or any mining organization is the spatial license to operate. So it describes what that risk is. It talks about the root cause, the potential impacts, and how is it mitigating that risk. And then what's also interesting is that they talk about the opportunities for the organization to improve those relationships going into the future. So really giving you a, a nice picture. But I want to drill a moment on stakeholder relationships. Uh, because I find often in integrated reports, organizations really uh, provide a superficial picture of their stakeholder relationships and how they engage with stakeholders, etc. And what worries me even more when I talk to executives from organizations that there doesn't seem to be a lot of urgency or enthusiasm about these stakeholder relationships. But at the end of the day, organizations do not create value on their own. They create value in concert with or in partnership with their stakeholders. So those relationships are extremely important to them. Redefine, as I mentioned earlier, property company, clearly tenants are very important to them. And they talk about how they, what their strategy is. They talk about why they engage, how they engage, what they talk about and what their response is to the, the various issues that come up in those discussions. But what is also important, and they reflect the quality of the relationship in an indicator, which is done on a five point scale where one is awful and five is excellent. So they show us what the quality of that relationship is. And that is important to somebody reading the report to understand how this organization um, is, is doing. In the case of Redefine, they believe that their relationship, the quality is at a three out of five, which is not perfect. It means work is, needs to be done, but they show you what they're doing around that. And it is open and transparent and useful to the reader of the report. Now, some organizations will underpin that evaluation with, with the metrics that they use to actually calculate it. So it might be customer satisfaction index or an employee cat, uh, satisfaction index, something of that nature. But stakeholder relationships are terribly important when one is looking at future value creation. Then let's look at expected opportunities. Changes in the external environment may render opportunities. Well, they often do. They, an organization needs to disclose material opportunities with potential implications for value creation. And, and it shouldn't just be a superficial statement. It needs to provide a realistic view on how the organization intends to take advantage of those opportunities and to explain the effect on future performance and ability to achieve those objectives and the availability of the capitals. And then also it should disclose information about the overall approach to maximizing opportunities and innovation. Pick and Pay is a, a retailer, operates in South Africa and some countries 
north of South Africa, in Africa, and also in Australia. But they do this really nicely, where they look at growth opportunities in the South African market, and they divide that market into three areas, the less affluent market, the middle market, and then the affluent market. And they talk about um, what the opportunities are in each of those areas and how they expect to take advantage of those opportunities. They also then show you the short-term consumer outlook and the long-term uh, uh, consumer outlook. So really helpful in creating a nice, uh, or, or enabling the reader of the report to get a picture of where the organization is going into the future. Now, I want to dwell on innovation for a moment because we live in a world that is changing so rapidly and innovation is really the lifeblood of organization. And at this very moment with COVID-19, we are seeing our organizations having to be agile and change their business, uh, business models, et cetera. So innovation is so, so important. Now, the, the international framework talks about this and it says that boards or those charged with government should drive innovation in organizations. And it's interesting if you look at the Nedbank report uh, from last year, and, and, and it's particularly good when it comes to the governance section. And you can see how the Nedbank board is moving away from a compliance mindset to one where it uses its governance to drive value creation. And it's driving a number of areas, one of which is innovation. And it says in its report and talks about it, but it says our board is aware of its growing role in innovation governance and the strategic importance of innovation in, in, uh, to create sustainable value. If an organization, if, if you can get this kind of information in the, in the report, it really gives you confidence about the way that they're looking at the future. And then expectations and assumptions. And the information paper says a realistic outlook assessment involves research, interpretation, and analysis of data. And it goes on to say assumptions need to be robust, supported by disclosure of lead indicators, sensitivity analyses, scenarios, trend analyses, and credible information sources. And it goes on to say that the organization should make a distinction between those controllable and uncontrollable factors, and it should explain the process involved in setting assumptions. So let's look at an example. Sassel is a chemical company that operates in a number of countries around the world quoted on the South African stock exchange, on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And they do this quite, quite nicely where they, on the one hand, look at growing population, higher living standards, which they believe will lead to increased demand for chemicals, heating oil into the future. But then they look at the mounting environmental pressure, uh, which is going to have an impact on the organization going into the future. And they identify the global expectations for a cleaner world. They believe that fossil fuels will continue to dominate the energy mix for the next 15 to 20 years, but they concede that it's going to be very difficult to get finance for, for that, that energy mix. And then you go on and look at their strategy, short, medium, and long term, and you can see how the organization wants to move away from fossil fuels, more towards uh, chemicals and cleaner energy going into the future. To me, scenarios are extremely important in a world that's changing so rapidly. And I don't think we see enough of them. But NetBank in its report last year did a really nice scenario picture. Obviously, the economic situation has a major impact on organizations. And so in trying to project the future of the South African economy became very difficult or is very difficult. So they said, we're going to look at three scenarios. And they named them after our president, Sir Ramaphosa. The first one, Rama reality. The second one, Ramaphoria. And the third one, Ramaphobia. So looking at those different scenarios, what would their strategies be in those cases? Really nice disclosure and helpful in making assessments about outlook. 
then sensitivity analysis, and this from Redefine, they look at issues outside management's control and the sensitivity to those issues, things like exchange rates, interest rates, etc. So you can measure or you can see the impact that it could have on the organization. What can they absorb and what can't they absorb? So as a reader, you can make your own assessments about it. Now, we've talked a lot about connectivity today and connectivity is so important, especially connecting those, um, those uh, items in uh, the, the content items in the integrated report. But connectivity is also important when connecting uh, performance with uh, targets and future targets. So the information paper says organizations should give a comparison of actual performance with stated targets, differentiating between those controllable and uncontrollable factors. And it goes on to say it should provide insight into the links between past and current performance with future expectations. Vodacom, which is a technology company, cell phone company that operates in South Africa and in several other countries within Africa, does this really nicely. You can see here the strategies, what was the performance in 2018, what was the performance in 2019, and then looking at KPIs for 2020, where it was going. So you can see the past connected with the present, connected with the future. Now, I said to you earlier on that organizations often don't have a section on Outlook because Outlook appears throughout the report. But some organizations actually like to do a summary and then cross-reference it to where you can find the detailed information in the report. And uh, Redefine does this. You can see there's a, a short overview, and then you can go to those various pages in the report to pick up more information. Well, what I've done is I've given you an overview. I started with a quote from Professor Mervyn King on the quality, uh, on a quality integrated report. And then hopefully what I've shown you is how organizations build that outlook information in their integrated reports and how they use the, the outlook information to complete the value creation story. And I've also hopefully helped you to understand how organizations answer that question about outlook that we see in the international framework. At the bottom of the page is that link to that information paper, which I used as a basis for my presentation. So if you didn't get it down, hopefully you can get it now. And I guess that's, that would be me. Thank you if there are any questions.